Welcome back to Two Keto Dudes. This is Carl Franklin from Connecticut in the United States. And in February 2016, I put myself on a ketogenic diet to take control of my metabolism. And in just two and a half months, I managed to reverse all my markers of type 2 diabetes with diet alone. As of now, I'm about 80 pounds lighter with no signs of diabetes or heart disease. Hi, I'm Richard Morris in Canberra, Australia. Actually, normally I would be in Canberra, Australia, but You're today in New London. I'm in New London, Connecticut. Yeah. Uh, I've been on a ketogenic diet for three years, and when I started, I was very sick with complications from type 2 diabetes. Within six months of starting a ketogenic diet, all of my biomarkers of disease had disappeared. I've also lost about 80 pounds, and I've completely turned my health around. And this shows a document of my progress through ketosis and Richard's experience thriving for years in ketosis. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully that might help a few people who are curious about this kind of dietary hacking. Yeah. We're not doctors. We don't want to give anyone any medical advice, but we are keen to share our own experiences. We're actually both software developers, so we're not afraid of a little technical detail, are we, Carl? No way, Jose. We have done some research into our own deranged metabolisms and the science behind them, and we hope to share some of that research. Where possible, we intend to put links in the show notes to cite research supporting any claims that we make. And you'll probably work out pretty quickly that we're both foodies. Yep. We love to cook. We mm -hmm. love to eat. Yeah, we do. And every episode, we both share a keto recipe that cannot be ignored. Oh, no, it cannot. Yeah, so let's start podcast number 76, Keto Fest. Hey. It's a wrap. <laughs> <laughs> so, Richard, do we have any apologies or corrections from last week's show? So, last week's show was Dave Feldman and Doing Science With, and mm. I think Dave nailed it. I don't think we have any corrections, but if you hear any, uh, please let us know. So, let's revisit what a ketogenic diet is, and uh, that's the reason we're here, the reason we're not on dialysis. <laughs> <laughs> and have all our toes. Yeah. It's a low carb, which is 20 grams or less of incidental carbohydrates a day. Yeah. No sugar, nor starch. Right. And uh, it's going to be a moderate protein between one and one and a half grams per kilogram of lean mass. And the rest of our energy we get from fat. fat. <laughs> wow, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, that, that that's was like, impromptu. It's <laughs> like a Gregorian chant fat. It kind of was. Yeah. We need to add a few more voices in since we're in the studio. <laughs> that's right. Who's our friend, Richard, that says, uh, just replace all of the carbohydrates in your diet with fat. That was Larry Lustig. Larry Lustig. And he was actually at Keto Fest. He was. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Larry, for that. Yeah. But that's good advice. Hmm. Well, Richard, here's a loaded question, but how was your week? <laughs> uh, we had a Keto Fest. We did. A festival. We were successful. I uh, know. It was outstanding. That, it, most people say that anytime you do a meeting or a conference that's got a couple hundred people or more, you mo almost always lose money. Yeah. And okay, we may have been very close, but we didn't lose money. Right. And that's a huge, huge success for us. 238 people came mm -hmm. with all of the uh, volunteers that Melanie Miller and the Heal Clinics brought, yep. plus our volunteers, plus yep. the speakers. It was over 300 people. You know, we couldn't have done it without our volunteers. Uh, we There were a lot of balls to juggle for, for the pair of us because it, we, we really swung for the fences. And it, yeah. was, it was a big task that we took upon ourselves and at some at some stages we were drop yeah you know, we were we were juggling 38 balls in the air and yeah. we dropped a few and it was just good that we had great people around us who uh, were able to step in and and um pick yeah. up the slack for us and you know it, it's thanks to uh, thanks to the volunteers uh that this uh whole thing came up yeah you know uh, i think somebody put it best they gave us an a minus mm. and i think i'd give us an a minus too yeah I mean, we, everybody had a great experience. Yeah. Had, you know, just a, a couple of snafus, but nothing major. No. And it was just uh, wonderful. We served over 100 pounds of bacon on Science Sunday. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. And we had 45 pounds left over. Yeah. And we basically <laughs> gave it away <laughs> as a gift. How so, often do you go to a conference and get and win bacon? 15 pounds of bacon. <laughs> Here you go. There you go. Yeah, it was fun. We also gave away some sous vide uh, devices that we'd used in the uh, the dinner for the VIP party. Yeah. yeah, and basically this was the Anova precision cooker. That's right. Thank you to Anova. Thank you, Anova. Mm -hmm. And also we made Coleman cooler versions of sous vide. <laughs> we did. Uh, basically, we took these big Coleman coolers and drilled a hole in the top and yeah. put some electrical tape around it. And mm -hmm. the 
sous vide device fit right inside. Yeah, and it enabled us to cook a, a prodigious amount of meat, just the one sous vide device. Spectacular. And it was all uh, chuck, chuck roast, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a bolar yeah, roast. We yeah. actually found a bolar roast, which is chuck. Yep. But it's the, as we said a couple of weeks ago, the top of the shoulder, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And it was, yeah, there we, I think we had two of them and yeah. they were 30 pounds each. Yeah. Or maybe we had three. No, we had two and a half. Mm, That's yeah, what it was. We did. Because I used the other half in my cooking demonstration. Right. Yeah. So we're in the process of putting together pictures and videos yep. and uh, the story and uh, feedback and all of that stuff. By the way, the evals were overwhelmingly positive, positive, positive. Yeah. Uh, and putting all that together and putting it at ketofest.com. So mm-hmm. pretty soon we're going to actually, and I say pretty soon, maybe in a few months, we're going to have the Kickstarter for 2018. Yeah. And the date won't be final, but we'll have an idea. It'll be either this date or that date. Mm. So we're hoping that people will just take a chance and and uh, and help us out anyway. Yeah. Yeah. What else can we say about Keto Fest? We we, we thanked everybody. Um, the people at the Guard, Jeannie and Steve Siegel, yep. were absolutely instrumental in helping it. Melanie's people, um, Fiorella, was a fantastic cook of chicken tikka masala. Oh, and her cooking demonstration as well, the poppers. Yep. I wasn't able to have one, unfortunately, because I was uh, doing some juggling. <laughs> yep. I had about 37 balls in the air at that time. Yeah, yeah. And Louise Reynolds with the salmon frittata. Yep. You and yep. Brenda did... Uh, the, the waffles. That's right. Yeah. And I did six types of pulled beef in 30 minutes, yeah. and everybody said I was mad to try it, and I nailed it. And I did the chowder. Yeah, mm-hmm. you totally nailed the, the six <laughs> types, types of beef. That was crazy. And Kim Harton did lemon cakes. Uh, Jill Knopoff did no-bake chocolate brownie energy mm-hmm. bars. And uh, Taffany Elrod, the chef from New York City, did crunchy cinnamon coconut oh, granola, yeah. which Wasn't was amazing. That good. <laughs> And Tara Scheimer did shrimp pad thai. And, um, yeah, what can I say? It was great. We had the makerspace packed the whole time on yeah. Social Saturday. I, I I think I enjoyed that almost more than the Science Sunday. Yeah. Uh, but they were both good. This is all part of what we do. Is It's, you know, half the time we spend on food and the other half we spend on science. And that's right. really what – that's – what our show is, it's, you know. It's a food and science festival. Yeah, yeah, it's a food and science podcast as well. Securoli Pig Farm brought a 300-pound oh, yeah. roaster, and they were cooking it all night, and uh, and it was wonderful. I actually Did you get got some the chow. <laughs> yeah, I got the guan chow. Like, I, just was, I wasn't there on time because I, I was be doing there. cooking demo, and yeah. I missed the jowl. Uh, next time, the dudes get the jowl. Seriously. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> we'll tell them. Also, my good friend Todd Evers and Scott Boyle and Terry yeah. Smith from Mystic Meat Locker, they mm-hmm. had sausages there that were smoked. Charcuterie, and yeah. Charcuterie. They had their lonzino and mm. some pastrami. Oh, they didn't have pastrami. They had jerky. And soupy. And soupy, which mm. is a hot sopressata. It's mm-hmm. uh, local stuff. And, and they, uh, they're they going to be on the web selling their stuff pretty soon as well. Wow. And uh, the River Gods, a local band, Ben and Nancy Parent, they played. That's right. We all got up and boogied, yeah. including Eric Westman. Eric Westman was getting down <laughs> with it. Yeah, yep. that's great. And New London Landmarks did walking tours. Yeah. And Wheeling City Tours did Segway Tours. Yeah. And Wheeling City said it's the best day of business they've ever had. That's right. Yeah. Um, Alan Meisner came down and did these fitness classes with yeah. just resistance training. Everybody loved them. They that loved was, them. Yeah. Yeah. He was great. Mm. And that was right on the lawn, right yeah. on the on the parade. Mm-hmm. So we had a lot going on. Oh, also, uh, Thames River Greenery was doing wine and cheese tastings all day. Right. And they were right across the street from right. the parade. And that brings me to... Mail! <laughs> so, mail! 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 <laughs> so, this mail actually comes from Charlotte Hennigan at Thames River Greenery in New London. And this was actually sent to uh, the op ed of the uh, New London Day, yeah. which is the local newspaper. And it reads as follows Keto Fest, a downtown New London success. Yeah. In praise of Keto Fest and hats off to Carl Frankel and Richard Morris for bringing a unique event to downtown New London. Mm. Well over 200 people stayed in downtown hotels, ate in the restaurants and shopped in our stores. This event had a real and positive effect on business downtown. Job well done. We hope they come back again next year. Yeah. And Charlotte told us that this was the best day of business they had had in her 42 years of being in New London, with the yeah. possible exception of when the cruise ships came, 
I think there's been a couple of cruise ships that came to uh, through New London, and they dumped a bunch of people out into the streets, and uh, those were also good days. But also, let's point out the restaurants that we turned ketogenic. Yeah. There was uh, Hot Rods. Right. Now, Hot Rods is a local wing joint. Yep. And about a month ago, Rod, who mm -hmm. is the owner. Rod Cornish. Rod Cornish. Mm -hmm. He called me up and said, hey, we got to talk about this keto stuff. Mm. He said he was in New Orleans talking to a chef, and the chef said, you know, there's a ketogenic food festival happening your, you know, in your town. And he goes, yeah, you know, I know that guy. It's like, <laughs> so he Everybody went to New Orleans <laughs> to get schooled about Keto Fest, and then he called me up. He actually went on the ketogenic diet, lost 20-some-odd pounds, and he put some great stuff on his menu. Cup of bacon. Yeah, he did a pint of bacon. Yeah, a pint <laughs> glass. A of pint it. glass of bacon. And, uh, as an yeah, appetizer. As an appetizer. Crazy. And he had prime rib and ribeye, and it was delicious. And the really cool thing about eating out that night was just about everybody at Keto Fest was used to being the one unique weirdo in town right. who was always troubled to invite to a restaurant because right. you know th they're always difficult to order for because we can't eat carbs, we can't eat sugars, we can't eat starch. Yeah. Well- we all had the opportunity to go to restaurants where just about everybody else in the restaurant was <laughs> also <laughs> were, were right. weirdos, and mm. the restaurant was actually bending over backwards to to, to look after us. Yeah. So when my uh, bill came, somebody had actually written on it, "Happy Keto." Yeah. Right. So you know, it was just it was just a happy, happy event. I had people coming up to up to me afterwards with tears in their eyes, saying that seriously, that was the best restaurant experience I've ever had since I went keto. That's so great. Yeah. And hats off to you, Rod. Mm. Um, Daddy Jack's also was doing the Carl's Head pizzas. There. Oh yeah, yeah. Yep. They, they ran out of Carl's Head pizzas. They so. ran out in an hour. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> so it's it's kind of a good problem to have, but we really apologise, yeah. Jack, because we yeah we really should have uh, we should have expected that there'd be a lot more. We, we should have. And he said, you know, next year he's going to do a buffet, right? Which makes a whole lot of sense. Yeah. Right. So uh, then we had The Social, which was doing burgers. Yeah, they did the Heart Attack Burger, the right? The Heart Attack Burger, <laughs> that's right. With uh, It's basically a burger that has the kitchen sink and, <laughs> and a fried egg on top, and mm. they call it the Heart Attack Burger. No irony there. No. And uh, then we had a Mambo, which yep. uh, not a lot of people went to because their specialty, keto specialty, was pernil, which yeah. is roast pork. But they've been eating pork all day. Yeah, no, that 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 was unfortunate. So we'll we'll, yep. we'll do a better job for them next time. Yeah. But the one that I really loved was the Thai place. Yeah. Bangkok City Thai. Yeah. We changed them. We came to them before Keto Fest and we took them some shirataki and we explained how they could keto up their meal, their, yeah. their pad thai, by replacing the noodles with shirataki and instead of using palm sugar, using stevia, better stevia. Yep. And uh, so they they tried it. We went back in sort of the week before Keto Fest started and the chef said, oh, I don't like it. It smells funny. Yeah, it smells funny it smells and it's off. wet. It's, it's too wet. wet. And yeah. they said, oh, no, you got to rinse it and yeah. dry it. And then he's like... Oh, okay. Yeah. So we gave him some more, and he basically did it right, and he yeah. brought it to us. And we, we had him like, make one, right? Yeah. And it, it was delicious. unbelievable. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we shipped him a few boxes from Amazon. Yep. And uh, he served it all up. And then we went back that night for dinner. After Keto Fest. After yeah, Keto yeah. Fest. Yeah. Yeah. And, we, and he brought out um, some, something that is normally on the menu with rice done with shirataki noodles and he said these noodles are better than the stuff that we're using for our noodles because the the pasta the bread based ones yeah. they fall apart yeah you, you can't you have to serve them right away they and, don't last and thai so sauces work better if you leave them overnight right so you need leave them with the noodles if you leave them with regular noodles they'll fall apart and it's nasty so so he's basically saying these shirataki noodles are a better product for right. my regular customers yeah than than the standard pad thai noodles he's been using. Blown away. I just love the fact that he was so overjoyed with these noodles and how excited everybody was to have uh, shirataki noodles in a pad thai yeah. that he came out with a brand new dish that he's just created. Yeah, yeah it <laughs> yeah. had basil hey, look, guys, and chili peppers. Look, yeah, and... look what I can make. Look, look what I can make with your shirataki <laughs> yeah, noodles. Yeah. He was like overjoyed. Yeah. And he said the only reason that he wouldn't put it on the menu normally is just because he has to train his people to... Uh, to, to cook with them. 
Yeah. Well, it also helped that he got the product for free. So, right. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. There yeah. is a cost involved, but still, it's outstanding. I think we have made some significant changes to New London. I think we can claim not only did we turn New London ketogenic for the weekend mm. and at over half the restaurants in downtown New London all had a ketogenic meal, yep. but some of them are keeping the ketogenic meals on their menus for the whole year. Right. And all of them want to be part of Keto Fest next time around yep. because because they were slammed with business. They just That's got right. so much business. So um, you know, from that point of view, I consider this to be an outrageous success. There was one more restaurant we got to mention, which is Wings and Pies. Oh, yeah, this that is pizza. For, yeah, it's a pizza place that also has wings. And I went in there a couple of weeks before right. and marked off all of the things on the menu that are keto. Mm-hmm. And I asked him to bring me a pizza on a plate. Okay. Had they ever done that before? They had never done it before. And essentially what this is, is just no sauce. Mm. Take all the toppings for a pizza, put it on a plate with cheese on top, put it under your salamander or in your oven or whatever, right. bring it to me. And that's it. And I'll pay the full price of the pizza. Yeah. It's a very simple idea. Yeah. And I got the steak bomb pizza. Mm. And you so that's steak with bell peppers and onion. Yeah. And mushrooms. <sighs> and mushrooms. And, and probably a little onion soup, like a little beef broth yeah, yeah. in and, there I could taste. And mo- and mozzarella. And sprinkles mozzarella on the top. Oh, it was so good. It was so good. And and you, we, we had one of those. We did, yeah. We went back and had one after. <laughs> Yeah, so that that place was well received as well, yes. and it's as easy stuff, yeah, right? Absolutely. It makes it easier for them. Yeah, that's right. But they scratch their head. You don't want a pizza crust? What? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it, can, I'm giving you less food. Are you okay with that? Yeah, sure. <laughs> and you know the thing is, if you're keto, you don't need so much. That's right. Padding. You don't need all that filler. <laughs> yeah, and I'd gladly pay ten bucks for what I'd normally m- buy a pizza and just right. not eat the crust anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. And then the final thing on Social Saturday was the movies. Yes, that's right. And we had uh, two movies. We had The Widowmaker. Yeah. And we also had uh, Fathead. Yep. And uh, we showed that at, in the guard at their 60-foot screen. Yep. And everybody everybody enjoyed that. Mm. And then on Science Sunday, we had a whole day full of science. And uh, starting with our, uh, our keynote and then you know finishing off with uh, Iva at the end of the day, yep. uh, wrapping up the show for us. And... Uh, People said to us, uh, Georgia Reed made this comment. She said, you know, you've done something unique here. Most conferences are just sessions. Yeah. Or most festivals are just like, you know, food trucks and, yeah, yeah. and what have you. What you guys were able to do is find multiple ways to get information to people. So for those people who learn best in a seminar-style setting, mm. there was a Science Sunday. Mm. For those people who learn best visually, there was the the movies. Mm. And uh, for those people who learn best practically doing things, there was the cooking lessons. Right. And then you had the experience of people being able to order and tweak their f- meals so that they were ketified yep. in a safe setting where uh, the restaurants were prepared for it and everybody around them was doing the same thing. Um, and, I, and we gave them coupons. W- so. The that's it. We, we encourage them to spend money. Yeah, yeah. Our goal was really to have these restaurants w- want to yeah. be part of this yeah, next yeah, yeah. next time around. So thank you, Georgia, for making that comment. Yeah. And she's spot on. Um, on Science Sunday, we also had food too, but it, yeah. you know we weren't doing lessons or anything. But we started the day with a bacon bar right after Megan Ramos left the stage. I so, know, right? Yeah, about 10 o'clock, the bacon came out. And then Julie from Fox Hill Kitchens, which if you haven't had her bagels or her buns, it's bread.2keto.com. If yeah. you go through that URL, that helps us by using our affiliate link. And yeah. you know, I don't know how much we make, but yeah. something nominal. We would advertise this bread even if we weren't paid for it because and everybody it did. was so good. Everybody's been raving about this because she made toasted cheese sandwiches. Grilled cheese sandwiches. And Everybody raved about it. Professor Richard Feynman actually said to us, I had one of those grilled cheese sandwiches and I totally expected to be knocked out of ketosis, but Brenda Zorn tested my my ketones and- Solid. Solid. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. So there's so no there's, glucose there's in no there. There's no glucose in them. Yeah. So that those were a big hit. And then people got the idea that they could take some bacon from the bacon bar yeah. over to Julie and, and Zoe. In, and she'd put it in a cheese And she'd toasty. put it in a cheese toasty. <laughs> And uh, and then uh, no maybe around two o'clock or something yeah. like that, uh, Fiorella Sist brought out this amazing oh, chicken tikka masala that had been stewing the night before. Yeah. And, oh, that that really is one of the best 
meals I've had since being ketogenic. I, I went back for two servings of that. Um, yeah. And that was also with the uh, the riced broccoli. Riced broccoli from yeah, Keto & Co. Co. Yeah. yeah. And uh, big shout out to those guys. They came down and, and helped us out in the kitchen. They did. And just uh, ma- helped make Keto Fest a big success. Mm-hmm. So that's it. Everybody went home and uh, satisfied, full, brain full, mm-hmm. and making some new friends. Yeah. So while we were at Keto Fest on Science Sunday, we got to interview Richard David Feynman. That's right. Who, uh, if you don't know who he is, you're certainly going to now. Yeah. This is the highlight of my Keto Fest adventure is getting a lecture from Professor Richard David Feynman on the Krebs cycle in front of 300 people. Yeah. So let's roll that recording now. Heard you say you do for a little and uh, we're here at Keto Fest. Yes. Yes, with Professor Richard David Feynman. And uh, Professor Feynman is professor of biochemistry, cell biology at SUNY in Brooklyn. And uh, that's all I'm going to say about him because his, his bio goes on. And uh, it's, it's, uh, we're very honored to have him with us. So welcome, Professor Feynman. Uh, thank you. Uh, I did want to say that uh, among my accomplishments is I ran the first low-carbohydrate conference in 2004. That's right. Wow. And I would have to say that on reflection, that was the second best low-carb conference <laughs> I know about. Wow. That's very kind of you to say. Flattery will get you everywhere. <laughs> yeah. and, and it was an international conference because I had a couple of guys from the Netherlands. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you uh, and uh, we and you did something similar in that we crowdfunded a conference w- with That's Kickstarter, right. yeah. and you crowdfund science. I did uh, better than that, or I, I would say that the crowd did better than that. I, I uh, don't want to underestimate how much uh, Gene Fine, who is the uh, director of this part of the research, uh, mm. h- how grateful we are to everybody for getting in there on the crowdsourcing. Yeah. And uh, what happened, uh, for those who don't know the end of the story, we did raise $60,000, which uh, wow. was very good. And the it radiated because the next week, when after the program was closed, the next week I got a check in the mail for $25,000 from an anonymous person. And the big break was a couple of weeks later, somebody called us and wanted to uh, give us a lot of money, which turned out to be $1.3 million. Wow. Wow. Well done. Uh, See, just be awesome and good things happen. That's what I always uh, say. And he he found it by seeing the uh, experiment.com. Yeah. uh, so, so what was the nature of the of the science that you were funding? I mean, it was obviously nutritional and diet. Well, related. we're we're uh, trying to treat cancer with ketogenic diets. Yeah, really. And uh, my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Gene Fine, who's in charge of this operation, uh, has done a preliminary study. So we had uh, ten advanced cancer patients. And we put them on a ketogenic diet for uh, a month. So it was a small study. And on the face of it, it was just a uh, uh, safety feasibility study. And they all did okay. They all liked it and mm-hmm. or at least tolerated it. And But we had some interesting uh, preliminary results. Uh, of, of the pa- These were very sick patients. You had to either have... Uh, failed chemotherapy or refused it to get yeah. into the study. Yeah. And half of them had either stable disease or partial remission. And those patients had the highest ketone bodies and the lowest insulin. Wow. Yeah. And so it's the wow. uh, insulin ketone body connection that's, that's critical. Right. And at the same time, in, in my lab, we've been doing uh, cell culture studies and we have uh, Uh, seven cancer lines, uh, several uh, colon cancers, and uh, several breast lines. And we treated them with acetoacetate, which is one of the ketone bodies. And that reduced the levels of ATP 
and also slow growth in mm. the, in these cultures. And we had a control of uh, normal human fibroblasts, and those were not affected by the. Wow. Uh, yeah, we we know from uh, from experience with our friend Mark Miller, sure, who had who I showed the slide this morning. He had prostate cancer and did a combination of and I, and I missed one thing that he did. He did a ketogenic diet. He did uh, the, the the exogenous ketones as well as he did the um, hyperbaric chamber treatment. And the, the research shows that all three of those together dramatically. Uh, right. The problem in the field is really that this was a very small study, but it's the only one. I mean, it's really, a, a, it, there are some going on, but as far as I know, this may be the only human study. Hmm. We got a very glowing editorial a review from Lewis Cantley, who is the head of uh, uh, oncology at Wild Cornell. And I, I think it's because we all know that this should have been done 20 years ago. Right. And uh, and it, it's not just that uh, we were off on the wrong track uh, or, or that medicine in general was, but we all were. We really un underestimated uh, the importance of ketone body metabolism. Yeah, that's right. So have uh, have people, uh, cancer patients, reached out to you in, in for offering advice? I mean, people are desperate for a cure. Well, we, we've got some people who wanted to volunteer, yeah. and we, we're going to start the trial in September, but it, it, there'll all be patients up at Einstein in the Bronx. Uh, I, I think what's uh, important is to recognize that well, two aspects of the fact that they're very dramatic anecdotal stories. Uh, and the problem with that, of course, is you don't know there is such a thing as a spontaneous remission and you don't know what else changed. But what they do tell you is that the diet is safe. Right. That uh, whether they got better for some other reason, uh, they were not hurt by the diet. And, and for that reason, I, I think, in, you know, looking long range, I think we have to say that the uh, uh, the glass is so much more than half full that yeah. we want to be optimistic. So what was the response from the medical community to that research? Well, I... We didn't get much response, but I don't. I don't think uh, you know. I don't think we could ask for much response. Mm -hmm. we, uh, the the uh, uh, <laughs> getting a, an editorial like the one we got from uh, uh, Cantley is all we wanted. Uh, right. You know, so uh, certainly nobody was discouraging. But we recognize it's a small study. You know, it's a research, and everything could. Uh, go wrong and uh, you know it's important to understand that we met with uh, the person who gave us the million dollars wants to remain anonymous we refer to him as the donor yeah uh, and we we met with him and uh, you know I said you know you, you got to know that this is research we could get nothing here right. yeah. and he said he understood that so wow. um, but I think what will uh, you know with the precedence that we have I think we have a good chance that's know? great just to add one more anecdote to the collection of stories. Is Matt here? Yeah. Matt. I want Matt to stand up and take a bow. And uh, before you do, let me tell your story briefly. Matt is actually a, a patient. He is just going by Matt. Uh, he's a patient of Dr. Nasha Winters and who put him on a ketogenic diet. And tell everybody what cancer you had or have. A soft tissue sarcoma. Yeah. And what stage was it in? Stage four. And you've been eating keto, right, for how long? 16 months, and do you have cancer? No. <laughs> the problem is, of course, no matter, uh, it's a powerful anecdote, but, you know, yeah. people uh, re can remain. But he's still here. Yes, he is. There are uh, several, and uh, they are very inspiring. You don't yeah. want to uh, get carried away, but sure. they're really telling us something. Yeah, they are. So is there any uh, interest in doing a larger study and taking that uh, research further from other researchers, or uh, is that something that your I team... I think there uh, were the... Uh, well, there are other uh, private funders. So Jeff Volek and Berta are, are undertaking a similar thing, and there are mm -hmm. a few other studies. Uh, the trouble is that the... 
NIH in this area is so behind the times. Uh, and um, th th this, <laughs> this study uh, was submitted to the NIH, and they turned it down, and we had the sense that the reviewer didn't know what a ketone body was. Mm. It was very discouraging. And then uh, uh, we had an offer for private funding, which uh, dragged along for a long time and then fell through. I won't mention the uh, sponsor. So when uh, the donor called uh, Gene, uh, his re response was, oh, yeah, sure, we heard this before. Mm -hmm. And uh, luckily, I uh, saved him from... <laughs> <laughs> the, the donors said that they were not insulted. They yeah. understood. That, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so it, it's very tough. I mean, and you know, it, even uh, crowdsourcing is maintaining that. You guys know it was. Sure. We we said that it was as much work as writing an NIH grant. <laughs> the difference was that we liked the people who were giving us the money. <laughs> <laughs> we feel the same way about Keto Fest. I mean, it was yeah. really. That it was wasn't just our vision; it was the vision of of everybody who got involved, and that's why all of the T-shirts and all the bags they co-sponsored because everybody who came to the first keto fest was part of that initial vision. The second keto fest, hopefully, will be uh, you know will be an extension of that. But it's uh, it, you know it, vision is not not in, it is in short supply. Yeah. So, yeah. Hmm. Well, you know, to answer your original question, I have the sense that there's we don't have at least at this point, uh, so much resistance to ketogenic diets for cancer. Partly, yeah. uh, the, the most bizarre phenomenon, as you guys know, is, is that we have resistance from the medical community to uh, ketogenic diets for diabetes. Yeah. Where, right. where it's just, uh, it doesn't make any sense. Oh, it makes we, sense to me. <laughs> well, Follow the money. <laughs> well, yes and no. I don't know. Okay. I mean, I, I'm a believer in what is known as uh, Hanlon's razor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which says that you should not invoke malice until oh. you've excluded stupidity. I, I totally agree. And, I'm, <laughs> I, and that's one of my favorites. And I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, when I say, well, I say follow the money, I, I, I just believe it's incentives. You know, and everybody has an incentive to feed their family. And when you threaten somebody's incentive to take away their job and their career and their their companies and all of that stuff, nah, you know, they, things they, get gi weird. they give it up as long as you don't uh, have to get them to admit they made a mistake. Oh. That, that's uh, part so. of the problem is we, we, yeah, we made no, a bad I, mistake 40 years ago and we keep doubling down on it. Well, if you uh, look at the uh, cardinal sins, pride is at the top. Yeah. Uh, avarice is towards the middle. Yeah. Mm. And uh, who made that list anyway? <laughs> uh, that's uh, I think that's uh, from the Catholic Church. Right. Uh, they, so uh, God <laughs> made the list. Uh, that's how, that's how it goes. Okay. Uh, uh, I've always been grateful that uh, lust is at the bottom of the yeah, list. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and overeating's right above yeah, that. Yeah, right. Yeah. So I. Uh, we all have a bit of pride, but I try to go for those. <laughs> so, what, so what do you think is the next so, the next uh, research that needs to be done to to move this forward? Because uh, from a point of view of a diabetic who, who's cured, I've cured myself. At least I believe I have. Um, it, it's frustrating that. Uh, Let me jump in here. In diabetes, the headline is "No more work needs to be done." Okay. Yeah. We yeah. have to go with what we know, and we have to start bringing it to patients who need it. It's as simple as that. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I mean, th this has been the uh, paradigm in diet research. If you compare a low-fat diet and a low-carb diet, if the low-fat diet wins, then that means low-fat is good. Right. If the low-carb diet wins. More work needs to be done. <laughs> well, no more work needs to be done. No. We need it, to go with what, what we yeah. have. Yeah. And, uh, you know, which is different than uh, saying, you know, our, our motto is what we know is much less than what we don't know, but still we need to move forward. Uh, in the cancer area, we need to do everything. We, yeah. we just, uh, you know, it's, it's what I was saying before. I've been 
working in uh, metabolism for a long time, and I underestimated the importance of uh, ketogenic metabolism. Mm. Is are there any uh, any tumors um, that is that grow in a ketogenic body? Uh, in, in, a, in a body that is, is it has adequate ketones, or? we don't know. We don't know. So no, that's basic we research we, we need. To uh, we've, we, we, it's very surprising how little we do know. I mean, you have to remember that there is no uh, cancer. There, there are many different yes. kinds of cancer, even in the same tissue. You, right. There, yes. There'll be several. Uh, so it's uh, that there are different cancers that may be more promising, as you undoubtedly know. One of the uh, the current guiding uh, principles is the Warburg effect. And Warburg noticed, uh, well, maybe I'll back up and give the uh, t- uh, two minute biochemistry course. Please do. Uh, yes. <laughs> well, you know that there are two major stages of energy metabolism. And glucose is processed through the process known as glycolysis, which is what it says, glycolysis. It it breaks glucose down. It breaks it down to a a three-carbon compound called pyruvate. And uh, etymology may help you remember this. Pyre means fire. Fire, uh, And uh, uvo in the Latin languages means grape. So the uh, uvula is the grape-shaped thing at the back of your okay. throat. Okay. Okay. So pyre, uh, pyruvic means burning grapes. In other okay. words, fermentation. Oh. Right. So uh, wow. glycolysis is discovered in fermentation. In fact, biochemistry comes from fermentation. Uh, in in any case, so the glycolysis is common to all organisms. Every uh, uh, everything from bacteria on up. Now, the pyruvate can be processed in different ways. The major process is to uh, be converted to a compound called acetyl-CoA, which is, if you know, uh, even freshman chemistry, you remember acetic acid. Well, this is a, a variation of acetic acid. And that's the substrate for the main processing of carbon, which, which is the Krebs cycle. But there are several different things that can happen to pyruvate, and one of the others is that if you're not running, if you're not running aerobic metabolism, in other words, the Krebs cycle produces uh, compounds that interact with molecular oxygen. So it's it's the combination of the Krebs cycle and what's known as the electron transport chain is where you actually uh, uh, burn the carbon mm-hmm. with oxygen. So uh, you have the two processes. You have glycolysis and aerobic metabolism, and the link is pyruvic acid. But pyruvic acid can also go to lactic acid. Right. And that will happen if you're not running so much of the aerobic metabolism. So, for example... Red blood cells. Yeah, red blood cells. And rapidly exercising muscle. Muscle can run both aerobic and uh, glycolysis. So you know that uh, rapidly exercising muscle will run glycolysis, and it will produce a lot of lactic acid. That's where cramps come from? Is that my right well, about that? Well, that's probably not true. No? Uh, the, it, they may, uh, they are actually, the lactic acid is, is used uh, right away. Oh, it may yeah. contribute because they are acids. Yeah. Uh, and the ionic effects, what they call uh, delayed onset muscle soreness, right. uh, is one of the uh, common things that uh, people don't really understand that well. I but just call it ow. <laughs> <laughs> ow. So, so one of the things I understood about the, uh, about lactic acid is, is it goes in and out of a cell through the same mechanism as ketones. And so as we become fat adapted, the I, transport... I, yeah, I think so, but it, it's more that in a lot of the cases it's just used again as a fuel. Oh, I see. Uh, so it, it, it is... But the, the relation to... Uh, the relation to cancer is that what Warburg found is that uh, if, if he measured the blood of people with cancer, mm. they were producing much more lactic acid relative to carbon dioxide oh, right. than normals. So that gave him the idea that this was... Uh, Metabolically uh, related. Yeah. And I mean, he did some very uh, clever experiments with uh, animals with uh, cancer in one arm and he would cannulate both mm-hmm. arms, sure. and he could... Uh, can, you, can you define that term for us, cannulate? 
Oh, uh, you just stick a uh, a tube into the uh, arm. Okay. Yeah. And uh, the uh, so the cancer cell was producing much greater lactate. Uh, oh, uh, let me say in biochemistry we use the word lactate and lactic acid completely okay. interchangeably. So, uh, uh, so th th there was much higher uh, lactate to CO2 in the cancer cell. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this gave rise to the idea that cancer cells, for some reason, were restricting their metabolism just to the glycolytic part, right. which, which is much less efficient in or le much less overall effective in producing ATP, mm. uh, even if there was oxygen there. So, and he thought that was the hallmark of cancer. He thought, it, well, uh, and that's a slight exaggeration in the sense that uh, n not every cancer yeah. shows uh, what's called, uh, well, it, it's usually called glycolytic metabolism, but it means glycolytic even in the presence of oxygen, because all cells run glycolysis. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, but we have a clue as to uh, which, uh, well, we know which ones are like that, and they also tend to be, and, and here's one of the reasons, you know, people ask, why do you want it? What, what makes you think ketones will work at all? Right. And one of the uh, pieces of evidence is that diabetes and cancer seem to be related. Mm, so, sure. the, if you uh, plot the incidence of, of cancer among people with diabetes, you see that uh, a large fraction, maybe 80% of the cancers correlate with diabetes. The ones that don't are the ones that are not glycolytic. So, for hmm. example, most prostate cancers, uh, there are exceptions, but most prostate cancers are not glycolytic. Uh, people with diabetes are not at greater risk for prostate cancer, and we uh, suspect that those are not the best target. Although there are, you know, good experiments that they did experiments at Duke with mm. uh, uh, mice and showed they could cure. Uh, yeah. But my, mice are a little bit different. Yeah, they uh, are. Aren't they? So you, you don't always know. So we're going to let you do a, a presentation in a few minutes. Um, tell us what it what it what you're going to talk about. Well, uh, it uh, one of the problems we have is that. The medical literature is, well, he, here's the way I usually introduce it. I usually say that the medical literature is, and I have in quotation marks, uh, full of mistakes, full of statistical fairy tales, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe half of it is wrong, <laughs> and that's the quotation. But I didn't say that. Okay. And uh, usually I'm inclined to say it in my blog, but not usually in print, okay. in the journal. <laughs> That's from the editor of The Lancet. Right. Oh. <laughs> so yeah. if it's bad, how come he didn't know it was bad? Ah, uh, he's an editor. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the problem we have is uh, that we're not doing science. Previous talks have explained not only how much we've trashed the uh, mm. diet heart hypothesis, but as uh, Eric said, you know, we got the uh, evidence that would make this approved as a drug. Right. I, I, uh, <laughs> yeah. If you could put it in a pill, if you could put ketosis in a well, pill. I, I, right. I'm laughing because I just happened to read something I wrote a long time ago. I, I came mm. across it. I said, you know, if this were a... Uh, uh, if this were a drug, everybody would be rushing to buy the stock right. in the company. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sometimes I say something smart. Well, uh, well, we're going to wrap up this uh, this interview, but but and let you do your presentation. But, but well, give us the, something the to last end on. thing is I, yeah. I'm going to try to tell you how to uh, look at some of the medical literature and kind of plow through some of the obfuscation because oh, right. it, it's yeah. real, great. intentional or otherwise. And uh, as a disclaimer, I did give a version of this uh, in Tampa. So if you've seen this before, uh, bear with me. <laughs> oh, I'm sure they want us. Professor Richard David Feynman, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Could you say you're due for a little... Well, Richard, you know what we forgot to do before we heard from Professor Feynman? What's that? Is give away a two-keto dude's coffee mug. Oh, we should do that, yeah. Yeah, we should do that. So, 
We have a fan club, if you、mm. don't know. Yeah. Just go to fanclub.twoketo.com、mm-hmm. and you answer a few questions and literally like four or five questions. And you basically sign up for our mailing list and for the fan club. And every show we give away something. And today's giveaway is a Two Keto Dudes coveted coffee mug. Yeah. Loot. <laughs> yeah. Booty. And today's winner is Mark Radley. <laughs> Congratulations, Mark. <laughs> Bye-bye. Yep, you, Mark, you get to look at our faces while you drink coffee. <laughs> that's right. Mark、uh, just went and said, Yep, I, I like you guys. I want to hear from you often. And here's my email and my,、uh, my info. And we just pulled the number out of a hat.、Mm-hmm. So, again, if you go to fanclub.2keto.com, you can be in the draw to win some loot. Absolutely. And that brings us to a segment called Recipes! <laughs> It's more fun when we can see each other. I know. Isn't it? Yeah. yeah, I know.、Uh, I'm going to go first and I'm going to do another one of my pulled beef recipes. Great. And you could probably predict that for six recipes, I'm going to be, <laughs> I'm going to be pulling pulled beef out of my hat. Right. <laughs> so this time I'm going to do a Thai curry. Oh. Okay. So you may remember from last week, but if you haven't, I'll just give a quick rundown on how you make pulled beef.、Mm-hmm. You get some chuck roast or bolar beef.、Uh, I use about eight,、uh, an eight pound、uh, bolar blade roast,、uh, but y- you know, you could use two or three, chuck,、uh, uh, three pound chuck roasts. Right. And you put them in a slow cooker. And you throw in a couple of bay leaves and you throw in some herbs.、Uh, I generally, with beef, I generally use、uh, thyme, but I, I will do the same recipe for a pork shoulder or for a lamb shoulder. And lamb, I'll use rosemary, and in pork, I'll use sage.、Uh, so you just pick the right herb for the, for the right meat, the right protein. So I like to put a little bit of liquid in the bottom of the pan so that the meat doesn't catch. And generally, I'll put like、um, ice cubes. Sometimes I'll have whey left,、uh, left over after making cheese. I'll put no it in way. Ice, yes, yes, whey. <laughs> I'll put it in a ice cube mold and I'll put like six cubes of, of whey, or it could be chicken stock or something at the bottom of the pan. The point is to, to, you don't want the meat to catch before it has a chance for some fats to render out. Right.、Um, so, and you, then you cook it for 12 hours and. Uh, at the end of that, you have、uh, what looks like very liquid, looks like a broth, like a liquid broth with meat chunks deep in it. Yeah. Get a couple of forks and just shred the whole thing. And what happens is the shredded meat fibers then start lifting up the liquid and taking it on. And so you end up with pulled beef. And it's delicious.、Right. And it's been cooked for 12 hours. So the flavors have really had an opportunity to develop. So now, then, normally what, I, what I'll do is I'll freeze.、Uh, 200 grams of that、uh, in a bag, and、mm-hmm. I'll come back to it、uh, the next day, or maybe in three months' time, or maybe sometimes even a couple of years' time <laughs> later. And you know, it's perfectly ready to go. All I need to do is throw it in the microwave for a minute or two, and then put the meat in a pan, cook it up, and it's ready for, ready for a meal. Okay. So that's the basis of the pulled beef. Now, I'm going to use Thai pulled beef. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to Uh, get a magic bullet, which is a,、uh, it's a little mini blender. Yeah. And into that, I'm going to add some kaffir lime leaves. And these, Where do you get kaffir lime leaves? And it's K A F I R? Yeah, K A F F I R. And、uh, you get them from, a, from the herb section normally in a store. It might be rare in, 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 in、yeah. the US. You might have to go to a specialty shop like, like an, an Asian Indian, market. Like an、yeah. Asian market. We found、like、an、that. Indian grocery. We did. In my town. Yeah, yeah we,、so、we had to, we, yeah, we had to、uh, run around town to get all the ingredients for、mm. Fiorella's uh, uh, chicken tikka masala. Yeah, yeah. So、um, I, I use kaffir lime leaves. You can also grow a kaffir lime tree. Oh, neat. Yeah, and、uh, it's, just, it's just a citrus. But, but the leaves have two segments. So it's like two little leaves, one after the other. And you basically throw it in the magic bullet. You add uh, uh, about, a, about a teaspoon for two people of ginger root.、Mm-hmm. So、um, I, I like to grate it before I, I grate it to put it into the blender, but the blender will probably mix it anyway. Right.、Um, I'm going to add, so I've, I've got kaffir lime. I've got some lemongrass, about a teaspoon of lemongrass, but a teaspoon of ginger.、Uh, I add some、uh, turmeric root, and that, add, that gives it a really yellow color、yeah. and a turmeric flavor.、Mm-hmm. And、uh, then I added、uh, a little bit of、um, uh, coriander seed. Yeah. So, and I put it in a magic bullet and I blend it up until it's, it's basically 
um, reduced down into to, to a liquid. Mm. And I've already got my pulled beef in the pan. I throw that on, and what that does is, I, I, and, and mix it well with the meat, and what that does is it hits the pan and starts to soften the flavours to meet with the flavours of the meat. Right. So you've already got well-developed beef flavours. Right. We're going to add to that these hot, hot spices that then hit the heat and uh, soften just a little bit. Oh, neat. And then uh, to loosen the pan, so I've got this this meat it's like tends a paste to get a, almost, right? It is exactly like a curry paste. Yeah. And then the meat goes a little bit dry because there's not a lot of liquid there. Mm. And to that I add... Uh, about half a cup of coconut milk or coconut cream. Nice. And cream is more fatty, so, you know. Right. Uh, well, um, I always get the unsweetened kind, kids. Always the unsweetened kind. Yeah. And I like to compare products like for like and get the one with the least amount of carbohydrate. Yeah, so, sure. Uh, and that's the Thai curry. And it's, uh, you know, I, I served, I think, 60 covers of that. <laughs> wow. <You're laughs> and amazing. that was only one of the meals I prepared in 30 minutes. I got to say, so. I had my doubts that you were going to do that, but that was really amazing. Well, well, Outstanding. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so and the first one to sell out, I might add. I, I think it might have been. I think anyone, everyone just wanted to see me fail. I think, yeah. <laughs> look what this <laughs> guy's like, doing. What's you he know? doing? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, so uh, I was lucky I had uh, Brenda Zorn as my helper. Right. And we both had uh, orange chef caps. Uh, right. <laughs> with ear flaps. <laughs> yeah. Which, uh, which kept us in check. Yeah. So tell me, what Carl, what recipe do you have for us this week? Okay, well, what I'm doing is I'm reading a post from Liz Myers, mm -hmm. and Liz is a friend of Brenda Zorn's, yep. and they rode basically from Minnesota on a motorcycle to come to us, and that's how she starts it. She and says- Brenda rode on a trail, trail bike, too. It was, it was oh, yeah. no, there was no uh, yeah. uh, city road bike. It was- Yeah, yeah. yeah. And she was fasted because she was doing the Feldman Protocol, so she, she was, had to be three days faster before the event. She's so. a titan. <laughs> Yeah, so Liz says, I rode almost 3,000 miles on my motorcycle to Keto Fest. I took the really long way. <laughs> LOL. I was oh, concerned yeah. about eating on the trip. I've only been keto for four months and wanted to minimize my exposure to and availability of non-keto foods. Because I was expecting high temperatures and any food I took would not be refrigerated, I decided to make pemmican. Ooh. Now, pemmican is a traditional food of North American native people, mm -hmm. or First Nations. Yeah. Traditional recipes call for thin-sliced lean meat dried over a fire, pounded into a powder, and mixed with rendered fat. Sometimes dried berries were also mixed in, but general opinion seems to be that the berries were added to accommodate the tastes of the Europeans. Right. My recipe is not traditional. Most pemmican recipes have a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio of meat, berries, and fat. But some are by weight and some are by volume. I chose to measure by volume, figuring I can add more meat or fat if needed. I wasn't all sure about the fattiness of the one-to-one-to-one -one -one ratio, so I added an extra half cup of meat. My apologies for not being exact on some of the ingredients, weights, and measures. I was making the pemmican while overhauling part of my bike's wiring, so my brain was more <laughs> focused on relays and waterproof connectors than keeping good cooking records. Yeah. And I got to tell you, they broke out the pemmican, Brenda yeah. and Liz, at the yeah. VIP party, yeah. and everybody loved it. Yeah. You should have seen Ivor Cummins' face when he was like, oh, <laughs> that was fantastic. Yeah. You need to do the accent. <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> uh, all right, so the meat prep. She says, I made jerky using a marinade recipe my husband keto-fied for me. Three pounds of lean meat, top round, sliced no thicker than a quarter inch. Yeah. You want the meat to be as lean as possible to stave off spoilage, so cut as much fat as possible off the meat. A cup of Worcestershire, a cup of soy, both sauces. Yeah. Uh, garlic to taste. If you can get the purple striped garlic, it's so much better than the regular white garlic. Yeah. Uh, throw all the ingredients into a bowl or gallon-sized zip-top bag and let marinate at least overnight. And shake the bowl or turn the bag halfway through the marinade time. Mm -hmm. uh, dehydrate the meat for 12 to 18 hours. And you want the meat dry enough that you can break it into pieces. You don't want it to be chewy like jerky. So you don't really have to use a dehydrator. You can just put it in the oven, leave the crack the door, right. put it at low temperature. 200 and, degrees, something yeah, like that. Leave it overnight. Yep. Um, fruit prep. She used raspberries, but you can substitute whatever fruit you like. Yeah. You know, keto fruits, which yeah. are the berries, strawberries, blueberries, raspberries, blackberries. blackberries. Yeah. So one cup of dried berries. And since 
I already had the dehydrator running. I just dried my own berries. I discovered that a 12-ounce container of raspberries made exactly one cup of dried berries. Now, fat prep. The fat needs to be rendered so it won't spoil. Yeah. There are a few ways to do this. I use the crock pot method. Number one, call around a few butchers to see if one can <laughs> sell you four to five pounds of beef fat. Yeah. And they will. They will. They want to get rid of it. Yeah. It's funny. Butchers see their value add as removing the fat from the meat Isn't that funny? Yeah. And so it's a, it's a waste product from them. And when you find a butcher you can work with, yeah. you're going to be there every day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, so if meat scraps are present, remove them and chop the beef fat into half-inch by half-inch pieces, then run it through a food processor. Put the chopped fat into a crock pot, turn on low, and let the fat melt down. I believe it took 24 hours for the fat to cook down. And you know the fat's done when it's all melted, and you can see brown bits, or cracklins, floating around in the crock pot. Strain the fat through a fine metal mesh strainer to remove the cracklins. And line the strainer with cheesecloth and strain a second time. So she's serious about this. This yeah. is just fat. Yeah. Here's the assembly. Powder the meat. You want about one and a half cups. So in a blender, I guess. I'm, I imagine it's in a food processor. Dehydrated in the blender. Yep. You could use a mortar and pestle, I guess. Mortar and pestle yeah. or a blender, yep. Break the dried meat into smaller pieces and run it through a blender. Powder the raspberries. Yeah. Mix the powdered meat and raspberries in a large metal or glass bowl. Add a cup of the rendered beef tallow and thoroughly mix. The mixture should be dry enough to hold its shape when pressed against the side of a bowl, but wet enough that it's not crumbly. And then press the mixture into an 8x8x8 pan lined with plastic wrap, cover, and put in the fridge overnight. And there's a picture of it, and it looks, well, should we say it? Kind of looks like poo. It does a little bit, I doesn't mean, it? Of course. You know, it's, it's wonderful and delicious, but that's what it looks like. She goes on to say, I tried the pemmican that night and wasn't thrilled. The flavor definitely improved after being on the bike for a day or two. Mm. Temps during my trip were in the mid-80s to mid-90s. The pemmican was in my motorcycle's luggage for eight days. It got soft, but held together well and had no signs of spoilage. Yeah. It's because it's got, got no water in it. Yeah. It, it lasts so much longer. And the, and you get the water all out of the berries and the meat, mm. and then you're putting beef tallow in. You know, it's going to have the salt from the Worcestershire and soy. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. It, you know, it yeah. kind of keeps all the bacteria out. Yeah. Great. So uh, apparently the, you, can, you can keep pemmican for, for months so uh, yeah. without any refrigeration. And it really was delicious. Yeah, it was, it was really nice. amazing. Yeah. So thank you, Liz, for being my recipe this week, and I hope <laughs> more people try pemmican. We will add a link to Liz's famous pemmican on the website at twoketodudes.com. Of course, if you have anything that you want to tell us, something we said wrong, something that you don't agree with, some more research that you found to support or refute anything that we've said, send it by email to dudes at twoketodudes.com or post it on our website. And you can follow us on Twitter at twoketodudes, on Instagram at twoketodudes. Mm -hmm. Make sure to use the hashtag Two Keto Dudes. And of course, if you want to join our forum, it's forum.2keto.com. And if useless swag is your fancy, you know, t shirts, coffee mugs, and other junk with witty keto sayings on them, head over to gear.2keto.com. And if you want a shot at getting that swag for free, join the Two Keto Dudes fan club. You'll be eligible to win something in every show. Fanclub.2keto.com. And if you feel like supporting our podcast and our forums, hit the donate button on our website at www.2ketodudes.com or just go to donate.2keto.com. You can also see our podcast and other videos on YouTube at youtube.2keto.com. And if you haven't already, go leave us a review on iTunes. Two Keto Dudes is engineered by Brandon Wen for Pop Studios and produced by Carl Franklin. That's me. Pop Studios started in 1999 as a full-service audio and video production facility with podcast production experience since 2002. Online at pwop.com. Well, keep calm and keto on, Richard. Yeah, keep calm and keto on, Carl. All right. And we'll see you next time on, on Two Keto, keto Dudes. Dudes, where Richard does another pulled beef recipe. <laughs> <laughs>